Hey, hello everybody, welcome. Welcome to the fourth episode in Media Vine's fourth Summer of Live. But what's the Summer of Live? I'm so glad you asked. In a nutshell, it's where we go live once a week for the whole summer, featuring expert guests on anything and everything that will help content creators build sustainable businesses. I am with you as always as your host, Jenny Guy. Thank you so much for joining us and a special welcome to first time media viewers. Hello and welcome. Uh, as a nod to today's wonderful guest and topic, please say hi in the comments and tell us about a cookbook that you cannot live without. Drop that in the comments. Tell us a cookbook that you cannot live without. Uh, and and we will we will see what you what you guys have. Speaking of today, though, we are sticking with our June theme of growth. However, today's topic is somewhat non-traditional. It is a rare month that goes by without us saying diversify your revenue streams at least once. And today our topic goes even deeper than uh, we typically do with diversification with earnings. We are talking about publishing a book. And we already know that content creators are passionate experts in their field, making you guys ideal candidates to write within your niches. But how do you go from dreaming about a book to done and published? My guest today is here to help. Jeffrey Eisner is the creator of Pressure Luck Cooking, a leading acclaimed and easy to follow Instant Pot recipe video blog. Featured on the Food Network, Good Morning America, and Rachel Ray, he creates his famously flavorful recipes at home in Queens, New York. His first cookbook, the step-by-step -step instant pot cookbook, which was released at the height of the COVID pandemic, became an instantly lauded international bestseller within a release, week of its release, hitting numerous charts, including USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, and The Toronto Star. He was the best-selling debut cookbook author of 2020. In April of 2021, he released his second cookbook, the much anticipated The Lighter Step-by-Step -Step Instant Pot Cookbook, which became the number one paperback book on USA Today and Publisher Weekly's bestseller lists. It features a slew of more health-conscious recipes tailored to those on keto, paleo, gluten-free, and diabetic-friendly lifestyles. This is amazing. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm living for your wallpaper. Jeffrey, welcome. Thank you so much, Jenny. It's a it's, uh, I feel like I'm talking to a celebrity because I watch you all the time and you are fabulous. So it's an honor to be here with you. You are uh, beyond fabulous. As I said, the wallpaper's fabulous. I'm so excited to hear everything. I want to ask you what Rachel Ray is like, but we'll save that for later. I'm going to pull up your presentation um, so that you can share and let's just get going. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so now as, as you said, I watch a lot of these series and a lot of the time we get invaluable advice on how to keep um, ourselves relevant, how to continue to earn, how to do best practices being a blogger and how we can succeed at life with that. But again, as Jenny said, today is really a little bit of a, um, of a tangent to go off because a lot of us in the blogging stratosphere are recipe creators, we're food creators. And also, you know, we I think a lot of us have that aspiration to possibly become a cookbook author. Because like, you know, why not? If you're writing recipes, who doesn't want to be published in a cookbook? What a wonderful gift that is if the opportunity presents itself. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my journey and how I got there. And hopefully if somebody else has a similar aspiration, this can maybe help you out a little. All right, so the number one rule to me that I've learned about writing a book is don't write it for the money. Okay, just don't write a book for the money because you know what? There's no guarantees it's going to make that much money. All right, that's what I said. But 100%, like you don't know if you're ever going to make anything past the advance you might earn, and I'll talk about more about advances in a second. But again, don't write it for the money. Write it for yourself. That's the key thing. All right. Again, write it because you really, really want to. Critical because when you do do that. That's when the best and most honest work will come from uh, come from within. If you're writing a book simply in the thought of making possibly making money, your your head is more in the game of you know just making money off of something that might not even end up doing that in the begin in the first place. You have to do it because it has to come from the heart. It has to be a passion and a fire within you to really do it. Because guess what, guys? It's an enormous, enormous undertaking and amount of work. But it's also one of the largest achievements and accomplishments you will ever ever know in your life. All right, so there are two ways to really publish. The first way would be self-publishing. 
Um, and the other way would be through a publishing house. Since I ended up doing this through a publishing house, we're gonna focus on this avenue. Uh, although there's nothing wrong with doing self-publishing, there are definitely pros and cons to each. With self-publishing, you basically earn everything, right? Because you don't have a publisher to have to pay for to do any of this stuff, to put out the book. But that being said, you don't have a publisher to do anything for you. They're not gonna be putting the books in stores for you. They're not really gonna be doing any of the marketing aspects. You, It's all on you. And you have to get all those orders out. You probably have to ship them out yourself or you have to pay a third party place to get it out. The, public, the, the, the benefit of working with a publishing house is that, especially a legitimate one, which we'll get into in a moment, is that they really do handle all of that work for you. You're, the responsibility of you is to just basically write the book and deliver it to them, and then they kind of take on the rest of it. They, they, they make sure it's printed. They handle all those things. They have the designer involved, all that. So you will you lose a little bit of creative control as well with a publishing house versus self. But at the end of the day, you're going to have a team of professional proofreaders, copy editors, things that are pretty invaluable if you want to write a really good legitimate book, not to mention they have a lot of connections to get your book in the right places. All right. So yes, we sing so goodbye self. We're going to be doing this with a publishing house. Okay. So let's say you want to write a book. The first thing that it's very important to ask yourself is what makes you so special to get a book deal? Why should you get the deal? I mean, obviously you probably have a good amount of traffic coming to your website. There are people who are following you and are obviously relying on you. If you're in Mediavine as one of the Mediavine publishers, you clearly have an audience. So um, that's something to immediately think about. What will set you apart from the rest of the other competition out there? I happen to focus on instant pot cooking. Instant pot cooking has, it's just taken over the kitchens by storm. It's revolutionized the way people cook. It is the hottest thing right now without being the hottest thing in the kitchen because it doesn't create heat. That's why I think people love cooking in an instant pot. It's also incredibly easy to use. Um, so that being said, if you look up an instant pot cookbook right now, you're gonna see hundreds of them, hundreds at this point, because everyone's realized, well, you know, this thing is very popular. Everyone wants recipes for them. Uh, so how do you set yourself apart from the rest of that? For me, it was, being um, I'm, my my approach to cooking is step by step, and I'm very much a visual aid type person, right? And I thought that I wanted to carry that over into my cookbooks. Now, am I the first one to ever do step by step photos for every cookbook and for every single recipe in my book? No. If you check out the Pioneer Woman, she has that in some of her books as well. But however, I was the very first to ever have done it in the instant spot in the instant pot space. Um, and now it sounds really great on paper, by the way, that idea, right? Because it's like, let's do all these color photos with step-by-step -step photos for every recipe. And then you have to realize, but I have to actually do this and photograph that. That means literally photographing every single recipe in the entire book, okay? And because sometimes you get a cookbook and they're great cookbooks, but every four recipes, you'll find a hero shot of what it should look like, right? And sometimes it's overly styled. Don't get me wrong, they look gorgeous, but I might be intimidated. I can't make that. I, I don't have like those little hibiscus flowers to put next to my chicken. You know, you know what I mean? Things like that. So I wanted the book to be very much an approachable look, like anybody can do it, not overly produced, yet at the same time, keep all those things in terms of a step-by-step -step process. I thought that was unique and something that was very different and would set it apart from the rest. So at that point, you want to basically write a proposal and you want to put all these things in your proposal. A proposal is typically going to say what the book's going to focus on and it's going to say what type of recipes you're going to put in there. Usually you put like a recipe roster, just write it out. It doesn't have to be not committed to that at that point. You can always change and it will. And um, you also want to put like three or four sample recipes in there. So the, whoever you're showcasing this to, um, probably a literary agent or a publishing house, uh, can get a sense of what you have to offer. You also probably want to put in there, obviously, your amount of followers that that will help you because it will. If you know, and I'll get back to that in a second. But when you're seeking literary agent uh, representation, you definitely want a proposal that's going to catch them. They get lots of these things. They get lots. And what's going to make your stand out? Do something that's a little bit more unique than the than the rest. Maybe even at the beginning of it, put a little video, embed a video of yourself saying, hello, how many people would do that, right? Something like that, catch their eye. Now, if you are a, a relatively large uh, influencer, um, and I think that I'm in the, like, I don't even know where I stand. I, sometimes I just ignore it at this point. Um, I am like, I'm not crazy high. I mean, I have like cumulatively between all my platforms, like over just over a million followers. And that's great. I'm very happy with that. That's wonderful. But there are people who have, way 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 more than that and um chances are if you are that high 
you're going to have a publishing house probably seeking you out. If you're like binging with Babish or something, they're going to come to you or something like that. They want you because they they want to capitalize off of you. I was one of the I was very fortunate because one of the publishing houses did reach out to me. Um, and I will get to that in a second and we can move on. OK. The five big publishing houses that are, I just want to talk about that real quickly. It's important before, because you're going to, you might get lots of different offers from other publishing houses that might be some really small ones you never heard of before. And I'm not going to knock them per se, but you have to do your research because it's very tempting if somebody's coming for you with an offer, which I got about five of them prior to what, when I actually got my, my big one that I took. And uh, they were, I'll get back to that in a minute, but Basically, the five that are the, mo the most key p five publishing houses are Hachette Book Group, which is what I'm with. I'm with Voracious, which is an imprint of Little Brown. You might see in a lot of cookbooks, you'll see Race Point Publishing, probably. Um, that uh, I believe that's like Sally's Baking Addiction. I think she's published by them. You have Harper Collins, which is a huge conglomerate. They uh, also cover William Morrow cookbooks, and you'll see Joanna Gaines' book with them, as well as uh, Reed Drummond's Pioneer Woman's books with them. William Morrow is kind of, I feel like, a celebrity type situation. You got to be pretty big for William Morrow to come. Then you have Rux Martin and HMH. Lots of HMH books are instant pop books, by the way. I've seen lots of them published by HMH. You have Macmillan, which is more of like text textbook type, I feel like, publishing house, but you, you'll see Bluebird, which are some uh, legitimate cookbooks for sure. And then of course you have Penguin Random House, you have Knopf, Doubleday, and then you have Clarkson Potter, which is like Ina Garden and Martha Stewart is represented with them, as well as a lot of other big bloggers are Clarkson Potter represented. And then you have 10 Speed Press as well. And then you have Simon & Schuster, which is um, has some books from Adams Media. So those are the top five publishing houses. It's always important if you're getting an email from somebody or a publisher, if you're reaching out to them, do a little check into that. See who owns them, you know, because it's easy to fall under all these little imprints within one giant conglomerate that it is. All right. So there we go. Those are the top five. Now, it's important to know in this situation, guys, because you might want to have, you know, do act on the first offer that comes your way because it's super exciting to write a book and get one, especially if you put all that time into the proposal and you found yourself a literary agent, or if you didn't even do those steps yet and people are coming to you, be patient. You have to trust your gut. Don't ever settle on a publisher that doesn't have clout, okay? I had a few places that reached out to me. I did my research, as we all do now, Google stalk them, see what they're up to, what they've done. If they don't really have anything that looks like they can offer you anything um, significant or might be able to get your books out there, and, and ask them the tough questions. Ask them, well, what, what do you envision for the photo shoot? What do you envision for the advance and all that stuff? And if they seem like, um, you know, well, you know, we'll talk about that a little later. We're just more... Forget about it. Walk away. Because I'll tell you something. If you write a book and you put all that hard work and time into it and it bombs... You're not going to get another book. No one's going to want to come after you again because you've proven at this point you didn't sell your uh, sell a book in the first place. So why should a large publishing house come and work with you at this point, right? You need to really be very strategic and patient here, and that's the hardest thing for me to do because I'm a Long Islander who is who lives in this city all his life, who is waiting in line to get his salad at the at the salad bar place, and I, I'm like, can you just please pick what you want in the salad so I can get back to my office? So you have to be patient. All right, so always also and very key, hold true to that vision and the proposal that you had, okay? Don't hold, if you want a book to be done your way, make sure that you truly hold down to the vision that you have, okay? You have nothing to lose, you have everything to gain. So let's move on to how the process begins. We've started with our first step, which was our um, finding, basically writing the proposal out and then having representation, great. Let's say you've gotten those things at this point, terrific. Now let's talk about your advance. You're going to be doing the budget and negotiations about 10 to 24 months before the book comes out. This is all, I know it's a very broad range, but it depends. When I did my book, they literally came to me in June, we signed, and my book was out the following April. I was on the fast track and I was a first time author. It was insane and it was scary because I had no idea what I was doing. As most of us don't really know what we're doing in life anyway, we just fake it and we just, until we make it, right? That's what you have to do. An opportunity comes, you say yes, and then you sweat it out and have a glass of wine and you figure it out. So the advance when you have a book, if you are, if you have a decent following, and even if this is your first book, never settle for less than about twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars for your first advance. That sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money. But let's not forget, out of that advance, if you have an agent, which you likely will, fifteen percent of it's going to them. This money is going to be taxed too, obviously. Don't forget that. 
And you are typically responsible, the author, out of all this money, to have to pay for your photography for the book and pay for your ingredients and the recipe testing. So at the end of the day, it's all about putting your budget hat on, being a little bit of a CPA and figuring out how much of this money am I actually worth and how much of it am I willing to give away to other people? Now you can, of course, gamble and say, well, this book's going to do really, really well. I just know it's going to do really well. I'll end up making a lot more money when it sells, you know, past what my advances and I earn my royalties. But you don't know that. There's no telling. There's absolutely no telling whatsoever how well it'll sell. So you have to be smart about the money. Some people are already their own photographer. They'll do it themselves. They're like, I already take pictures of my own food. I could do this myself. And uh, I don't need to hire a photographer. And if that's how you feel, wonderful. I am lucky if I can take a picture with my iPhone and it looks like food that I want to eat. So I knew that I wasn't going to be the photographer for my book, not to mention the thought of having to cook everything and then photograph it. Absolutely not for me. Plus, my book was very unique in the sense where it was about this is the book, by the way. The first book, it was 100 recipes and every single recipe has literally step by step shots. And then a final shot of every single thing in it. So the thought of having to prep something and then photograph it and then clean it up. Yeah, you'll make extra money doing it. But at the end of it, you might have more gray hairs than I do right now. And I'll tell you, these definitely came while I was shooting my books. So it's very important about all that money, I mean, not money, all that advanced stuff. Um, and to understand that when you when that is presented to you, talk to your agent about it, talk to yourself about it. There are some rare circumstances where, where you're a first time author, where they might say, well, we'll pay for your photography team. We'll handle all that. And your advances as a result might be lower though, because they're technically taking money. So it's really about, here's a, they're basically saying, here's an amount of money for you. You, you. It's yours, no matter what happens, no matter how bad, well or bad the book does, you're guaranteed this money. But out of that money, you need to give us your photos for your book if there's it's a cookbook. You need to make these recipes and do the whole process, okay? So that's important, very important to remember those things. Now we can move on to the third step, which is writing the manuscript. All right, great. You have a book deal, now you have to write it. <clears throat> and it's a little bit scary. So the advance, by the way, let me talk about it. You typically get paid in fourths or thirds. The, four, the first is when you sign. Great, you get a third or a fourth of it at that point. You get the next payment when you've, of course, they call it delivery and acceptance once you've sent them the final manuscript and all the photos that go along with it. Third will be the publication day. And sometimes when there's a fourth, they'll give it to you a year after the publication day. So it's an interesting concept how it works and it all depends on the publishing house. So the manuscripts, um, when you are going, when you've signed and you've got everything going, you'll be dealing with somebody called your editor at the publishing house and their associate, their assistant known as the associate editor. You'll write your, um, you basically, it's very key to set your delivery dates with these because you have to be organized when you're writing a book. You really do. You, you, there's no dilly dallying, create a schedule, stick to it. Deadlines are very important with books. You don't want to, first of all, you don't want to make a bad impression on a huge publishing house when they're taking, a, you know, uh, giving you a great opportunity. And you want to just make sure that you're all on the same page, so to speak. So set dates, say, okay, I'm going to give you my manuscript by this date and um, please give it back to me by this date. Just, just get all that out of the way. It's very important. How long will it take you to write your manuscript? It varies. Some people it could take two years, some could take six weeks. I wrote my first book, I, they came to me in June of 2019. And we, they came to me in March. The deal was finalized in June. Uh, we, I had a trip to Alaska booked, and I told my partner Richard, "Well, this is this is the last time you're going to see me sane for a while." And as soon as we came back from seeing humpback whales, I became one myself because I had, had to constantly eat food and test things and write things up. So we were basically, I, I, I was I hold myself up in a room for about six to eight weeks and I just cranked this thing out. I was at the point, so I we agreed upon the in the book that it would be 50% uh, existing recipes from my blog and about 50% fresh exclusive to the book, which makes sense because you, you're you bringing people to the book to give them some of their favorites that are the most popular recipes on your website, which are easy to gauge. And then you're giving them things exclusive to the book so it gives them more reason to want to buy the book. Um, and uh, I basically, at that point, it becomes routine. All of us know this as recipe creators. You know how to write a recipe in your sleep at some point. So it's not the hardest thing in the world to do. I would write about five to six a day. And it would take me about eight hours and lots of craziness. So you get that out of the way. You feel great about it. Always set your goal. Say you're going to do a chapter a week or something. 
get it to your publisher. And then I would say, get that to your publisher, the first draft of everything, no later than one month prior to your shoot, if possible, because they're going to then, uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. Get that to them about um, two two months before your shoot. Then they're going to then tell them, I need this back in about a month or so. And then they'll give it to you. And then you'll you'll handle their edits and then send that back to them about a month. So you have about a month of breathing time before the shoot. And then you can go through everything you've, you've sent them. You can print out your manuscript. And then you can start to basically prepare for what is the hardest and most challenging part of this entire process. If you're a cookbook author, the photo shoot. Now, the photo shoot's going to happen about six months before publication day. Um, as far as I've learned it. My situation was more unique, and let's go back to that advance and how much you're making for your advance. Out of what I was doing, I could only afford one photographer and one stylist, and that was three of us. And to save on costs more, I decided to do it in my apartment versus renting a studio. Luckily, it was central enough that everybody could get there. Um, we figured it out, we worked out a process. Um, but uh, the way this works is, what I can't recommend, I cannot suggest this enough, is if you've never done this before, especially, and if you're going to do it a little more homegrown like I did, where I didn't actually have my publisher find me my photography team, um, and I just found one myself because I had a friend who was, but they will typically, if you're with a publishing house and you don't know where to start, they will give you resources. That also was a benefit. Um, audition them. My photographer was like a, was an acquaintance of mine who, um, you know, we basically... I found that he, I knew he was a photographer, but I didn't really, and I knew he did amazing work, but I'd never seen food photos. So I said, I reached out to him one day and I was like, do you ever, have you ever shot any food before? He goes, I do lots of still life, but not food. And literally within 10 minutes, he sent me like five pictures of his dinner that he just, I'm like, okay, I love you already. You're amazing. You're proactive. And I feel like I can trust you. I'm like, so I'm like, let's set up an audition. Would you mind coming over and maybe we could do a test run and then I could talk to my publisher and they'll approve, blah, blah, blah. So we came over, we set everything up. We did it. We did like three recipes in one day and we realized, okay, this is going to be grueling and difficult, but we can do this and we could probably do more than three. So we immediately established a process in that moment. Um, and then from there, we, we were, I was able to um, realize that we have something that's going to be not only one of the most challenging things we're going to be doing, but at the same time, we can we have now have, an, have a system in place where we know how it, for it to be efficient. From there, you want to have plenty of plates and props. Go to Ikea, by the way. It's like the cheapest. It's so cheap. And they have a great variety of stuff. I was in heaven when I walked in there. I'm like... You have this, you have that. But also, if you're a food blogger, try to instant brands. I work with them. Um, they own, are owned by Corel and they have lots of plates. So, like, say, if, would you mind sending me some plates? If you can, any, if nothing's going to hurt. You know what I mean? Like, don't, it never hurts to ask and just say, listen, it, they're not going to be, a, they, how upset would they be if they see one of their plates in your book? And then in the acknowledgments, you say, thank you very much for sending me some of your plates. It's great. It's a win win situation. Be organized, like I said, it's so important when you're doing a photo shoot for a book, create a schedule. And my case, which again, rare, we did it over four weeks. We did five to seven recipes a day. So about 25 recipes a week over four weeks, 100 recipes. That would mean that uh, I had to basically set up categories for each day, knowing exactly what we'd be shooting. There's very little room for error. Um, and to make sure I was also able to create grocery lists off of those uh, schedules. Uh, because at that point you have to go food shopping for 25 recipes on a Sunday. This is what I did in New York city, by the way, talk about a good time. Um, <laughs> no car to be doing this really anyway. So, um, yeah, you want to go and you want to make sure what I did was I set up every Sunday. I would go to the market, do my thing, clean up my fridge from the weekend before and just load it up to the brim. I, I don't even know how I still how I did it, but I did it um, with one refrigerator and storing everything in there, stuffing it. And if I can do this, by the way, anybody can do this at this point. So. Be, do that. Make sure you get uh, any list, by the way, is the best app ever for shopping because you could bring a friend with you and you could just mark off like at, in real time. It'll just cross off what, what was taken. So amazing app for that, by the way. Um, at the end of each day of the shoot, have your photographer send dailies to your um, which, by the way, which just means the shots taken that day to your editor or publisher. Uh, so they can just start going through them. In this situation, again, it was 100 step-by-step uh, -step recipes. So every recipe in addition to the final shot had 
step-by-step -step photos of each. At the end, we had like 30,000 photos were taken in this book. Um, it's I felt so bad for him uh, on many levels, but we lived and we learned. And then when we came back for the second book, you realized I don't have to take as many step-by-step -step photos at this point. Plus some can be honestly used in multiple recipes. Like if it's a shot of the lid on the pot, guess what, just duplicate it. Um, or if it's onions that are, you're just, uh, it, again, it becomes, he realized these things and you live and learn like any process. Like I said, fake it till you make it. Um, so that's important. It's about organization. Always make sure during the photo shoot above all else that you just have structure, that you know you're gonna be in a room with the same people. Try to keep tensions low. Sometimes creativity can butt heads between the person who wrote the recipes, the person shooting them and the person styling them. It's always about you are the boss if this is your book just keeping a level of harmony in there. And luckily I had a wonderful team. And of course we're human. Yeah, every mo every few moments, there was a little bit of a, a kitchen shear. You can cut the air with a kitchen shear, but we got through it and we did spectacular work that I'm super proud of. So organization, photo shoot, keep your sanity. Now, after that, when you're done, when you have basically gone through every recipe and you're shooting it, again, my situation is a little more unique. Not everyone's doing a cookbook shoot with 100 recipes and step-by-step -step photos, although I will tell you, they do sell well. Um, you worked hard for that, and believe me, you, I, I feel like it paid off, thankfully. Um, what you want to do now is relax after that. Just collapse and spend a few days, take a vacation. You do deserve it. You're going to get your editing back now, your manuscript back from your copy editor. So the, you send it to your regular editor, and now it's coming back from the copy editor who has gone through what you sent them before and is going to put all those grammatical touches on there, cookbook lingo, things you might not really be familiar with, changing some words. Like somebody, one time in my other word, they use like, it, it, mix it until it's emulsified. Until, I'm like, I don't use the word emulsified in my writing. Like, we're going we're gonna to nix that. You write the word stet, stet, S-T-E-T -E in the comments when, you, when you're rejecting their changes. And sometimes it feels really good to reject the change. I'm not going to lie. It, it felt great. Um, <clears throat> but at, this, at the end of the day, they are the experts. They know best. They are out. Their best interest is to make you look great, of course. And I trust my, I have a wonderful publisher. I'm very fortunate. By the way, if you're looking to do a book, Voracious is fabulous um, of the Hachette book group. And uh, you'll basically from there do all those things. This, you're going to be going through your manuscript a lot and you're going to be taking all the tweaks you made while you did your photo shoot and implementing them. So if, let's say you're making something and you're like, oh, you know what? This should have had uh, two, an extra teaspoon of garlic powder in it. You're going to be doing all that here. So be meticulous. Any notes you take during that photo shoot, make sure they're on nice legible paper, whatever you're doing it. I had a three ring binder printed out of my manuscript as I went through and did the photo shoot. I marked it up. I, Maybe one day it'll end up in the Smithsonian. Who knows? Probably not. But just take good care of these things and then implement this here. Send it back off to your copy editor. And then it's going to be a few more rounds of back and forth. The proofreader will go through it. And you're going to be read, combing through it like a hawk to the point where you're going to become numb reading your own book so many times, just as your editors will be, I'm sure. It's definitely a situation where you have to take a moment and step back from it and breathe. The sixth step. Okay. So we're about one to six months before. Publication day, we're on publication day, and we're after it because the marketing never stops once you write a book. So as soon as the book is announced, in my situation, it was announced about seven months before it came out, um, and I th that was a while I thought. And so, uh, and I was actually by surprise. I didn't realize it was going to be that early. It's actually uh, somebody found it. One of my followers like, "You wrote, you're writing a book," and I'm like, "What? Do you, we didn't announce that yet." And it was lo and behold, it was on Amazon. Sometimes it just it goes on to Amazon and. My publisher was even surprised. They didn't realize it would go up that early, but it, when it's out there, it's out there. So I made the announcement, tell everybody about this. And the, the thing that's important about this, guys, to know is that the publishing houses, no matter how large it is, they're gonna rely on you to be the key marketer here. That is why they probably reached out to you to do a cookbook in the first place, because you have a following. They want you to do a lot of that work to get it out there. Otherwise, why are they taking a chance on somebody who doesn't have a television show or, you know, somebody? It, it's all about you doing it, and they know that they're go that you're going to for the most part. And of course, you're going to. You just spent all this time doing something, um, and you want everyone to know about it. So be clever about it. Don't necessarily shove it down people's throats per se, but just you know, let them know you've you've asked me for a cookbook. I've given you a cookbook. I'm so excited to share my cookbook with you. Just be your genuine self and explain how excited you are for what you just did. And I think people will really take part in that with you because they, they love your recipes that they're following you, right? They want your book. They're going to want to try your book. I mean, some people are going to say, I don't do cookbooks. I love you, but I don't do cookbooks. And then, you know, you get over it real quick. But whatever. What can you do? Now, you're not going to ever please anybody, by the way. 
you know, never will ever. So just always know that too. Um, basically, yeah, put it on your social, send it out in a newsletter if you have it. If you have a connection, use it. If you, um, important to know this too. The, pu the publishing houses, you know, like I said, they're going to rely on you the most. They do have publicity departments, they have marketing departments, um, but don't always rely on them that they're going to get you that gig on Rachel Ray or they're going to get you onto GMA. They might certainly pitch you onto these shows, but it doesn't mean they're going to get you on there. Use connections. If you have any connections, use them. Like, it's not going to hurt. When does that ever hurt? That's what life is built on, networking a lot of it. Use connections. See if anybody knows anybody that they can maybe get you into something. And here's my book. And what it, can, it doesn't hurt to ever ask. You don't ask, you don't get. Um, in my situation, luckily, I had already been on Rachel Ray and GM, before that and GMA. And uh, so when we ended up talking to Rachel Ray's people, again, they were like very excited about it. So I was lucky. So it's about having those relationships with these producers and, you know, m knowing you're a good guest. So I've now been on her show. What is it? Four, I think four times. So this was a good, a huge um, blessing that I was able to get that out there. Uh, Keep your relationships going, but don't always rely on your on your publisher to do all this for you because they're probably not going to be able to do all. But they have a lot of other authors as well. Um, of course, the tit for tat situation with other bloggers. Hey, would you mind promoting my book? I'll promote your book. That doesn't hurt either. Maintain your. I know a lot of bloggers. Some of us uh, aren't the friendliest with each other. It's a competition. It's, it's a lot of world out there. It's how it is. But you know. At the end of the day, it's also about helping each other. We're in the same world, we're in the same business, and you want to support each other, right? So it's a good way to get your book out there as well. Um, yeah. So now let's talk about the money aspect because, yeah, it is nice to write a book and it is nice to make a living off of the book or earn money, I should say, off of the book. Now, uh, yeah, you're going to get what you got in that advance no matter what. Now, if, if the book sells one copy, you're getting that all that advance, it's all yours. Uh, if the book sells a million copies, you're getting that advance and then the royalties that will follow it. When you start earning royalties is after you've earned out your advance. So in other words, let's say your advance is $50,000 and the book has sold enough copies where you have earned that 50000 which is about if you're writing a paperback, which these books are, is 7.5% typically uh, per copy. So once I've earned $50,000 worth, then I'm going to start earning on every single book 7.5% that's sold after that. OK, and that's for paperbacks, hardcovers or are more usually about 10 to 12 and a half percent. And that sounds appealing. And I, you know what? I was a little disappointed when I found out my book was going to be a paperback because I just thought, like, I want a hardcover book. You know, like it's like, oh, it's hard. It's it's nicer. It's but guess what? These come in. The paperbacks are a lower price point, which is more affordable for people to buy. And that's important. A lot of people want things that are, they feel like I can buy two of these. I can get one for a friend. This. So when you think about it, yeah, you're earning a few and a half percent less and you might not have that hard cup of book you really, really wanted, but you might be ending up making more as a result and selling more copies because it's more affordable and more accessible to some people. So there's that. Um, and by the way, it, let's say the book is retailed, what this is at $19.99, my book. Um, no matter what this is sold at, if it's sold at online at $10.68, I'm still getting that 7.5% off of $19.99, no matter what it is. That's how it works. So what is that, like $1.50 or something like that I make per copy? But after that, 15% of that will go to my agent. I had a instant pockets a certain amount because it's, you know that's how things work. Um, and that's how you do with partnerships. So, and then it's taxed, of course. So you think about it, that's how you will, it will make money. There's no way to predict how this will ever go. All you can do is just hold true to your vision, say to people like, you know, like, this is my life's work. This is something that I loved and what I've done. And honestly, at the end of the day, if it doesn't sell and it don't, but you still wrote a book. How many people can say that they've done that? How many people can? Again, to go back to the very beginning of this entire thing, write it for you, not to make money. And um, from there, let's talk about bestsellers lists. They are really nice to have, but they are by no means a measure of greatness at all. Um, again, like I just said, you'll see in this top thing, you've, wrote, you've written a book. You should, that should really be enough. It really should. Your mom, or your dad, or your dog, they're going to be very proud of you. Um, and you should be super proud of yourself. Now, let's talk about really quickly the New York Times bestseller list because I was super interested about it. I was like, what does this mean? What is it? How do I get on that list? It's not really a bestsellers list. It's not. It has really nothing to do with sales. 
The list is basically, it, it's infamous. You just do some searching on it and you'll see. It's a proprietary formula they use. And it's really just like, here's our best picks list versus what books have sold the best. They don't go basically, they go, they pull from all these different little things. It's no way of knowing about how, what will make it onto a list or what won't make it onto a list. And uh, I know for a fact that it's like that because when my last book came out, it was the number one cookbook. It was the number one paperback. And yet in their how-to advice and miscellaneous column, what cookbooks would fall under, a book that underperformed my book was on the list and my book was not on the list. And wonderful to that book. Congratulations. And if it's, it's fair to those who make the list, but it's not really the fairest thing to those who don't. And that's how it works. Don't harp on it. New York Times. I would say, Jeffrey, I'm just going to jump in and say it it's probably, it, bloggers are uh, familiar with this because it sounds like Google. Um, yeah. And like, we know a fraction of how the algorithm works, but we don't necessarily know all the pieces. So we can control what we can control. Right. And at the end of the day, it's what they want to do. It's their company. It's their business. They, they don't have to explain to us how, we, how what, what, tough you didn't make it. And you know what? That's fine. I didn't make it. I don't care. Maybe a little. But still, if you're feeling extra proud, you should feel great if you hit USA Today, Publishers Weekly, Amazon bestseller list. Those are wonderful to have too. But at the end of the day, even if you make none of those lists, don't worry about it. It's not about that. When I wrote these books, I can tell you here and now, I never sought out to make any of these lists. I didn't care. I just wanted to do a, write a book that my followers would be proud of owning. That's all I cared about above everything else because this book is representative of you and your taste and your food and your life's work technically in a way. And that's what it's all about. So it's nice to have these lists. Sure, it's wonderful, but it, by no means whatsoever is it a measure of greatness. So I know it's a lot to digest in a short period of time, but uh, I just wanted to be able to share my little story with you. And I know, Jenny, I think after this, we'll also share a, a more detailed deck than when we just show with more information on it. Um, and I'm always here for any questions anybody might have as well. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. So many different uh, aspects of, of everything you shared. It's a lot. And there's quite a few that I want to drill down. And if anyone in the audience has a question for Jeffrey, please drop it in the comments and I will ask him. Um, I think. I would love to start with the proposal and get a little more granular about that. Do you have any top tips for writing a proposal that's going to stand out? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I actually technically, they came, so I, my publisher came to me before right. I had a well, how to write a proposal. But then when I got an agent, she's like, we need to, we still need to write one because we need to put a case. I need a case for giving, getting you a certain amount of money to write this book. Right. Um, so you the, the important thing about the proposal is this is your moment to sell yourself this is literally your pitch okay yeah you, you should you need to write down why this book is going to do well why you are worthy basically of writing a book and what's going to set it apart from the other books out there how many cookbooks are there there are more yeah. cookbooks than there are blades of grass outside in my lawn so like it's like you have to be very 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 particular how you're going to do this. You're a creative for everyone who's out there watching this or anyone who's a Mediavine publisher. You're creative. You are a creative person. You would not be a part of Mediavine if you were not. So really put on that thinking cap. Treat this proposal as it's one of the most important documents that you'll ever write. Don't overthink it, but spend some time on it. Take step away from it. Come back, read it again step away and then showcase some of your best recipes in there. Cause you want to put about three recipes or four recipes at the end to get them a sampling of what these will be like. Very helpful. And I don't know if anyone else has, we call them on, on the marketing team. We call them shower thoughts. <laughs> I find that my best thoughts come when I'm in the shower in the morning, shampooing or doing whatever. They just come into my head about something that I've been ruminating on for the last couple of days, weeks, whatever. They just pop in. I'm like, my shower thought is here. It is a lightning bolt. And now <laughs> I know. So give, give yourself time to have shower thoughts. Exactly. Um, you also mentioned while you were talking about organization. Yes, my marketing associate Brandon just said there is nowhere to write them down when you're in the shower, <laughs> unless unless you're like behind on your cleaning and maybe you can like exactly if it's exactly. gross. Yeah, go for it. Um, no one will judge you. So you mentioned organization because I have to say, I don't know if anyone else was blown away by everything you said, all of the recipes, shooting in a queen's apartment, yeah. one refrigerator, having all the people, trying to keep track of your edits. Um, do you have any tips on organizing that process? Did it, was there, were there any specific um, tools that you used to help you? Yeah, I mean, it's all about like an Excel grid or a doc, uh, what are you, Google Sheets that we call them? 
Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, Google yeah. Sheets. Right. So um, I did that every single, I, I would do that with my um, recipes. I would basically type in there um, what, what ingredient I would need, like an onion or whatever, like specifically each week. And I would then go through every recipe and type in and, and add it to the grid. And it would, it would yeah. add up. This is how many onions I need this week to pull from. It's not easy when you're shopping for 25, you know, recipes oh. a week. It's a lot. And so it's, it is key to use some sort of organizational tool. I'm kind of weird with my organization. Like I said, I use spreadsheets. Sometimes I'm as simple. <laughs> I just literally open an email draft and I just reference that and go back into that. I'm, I'm, everyone has their own process. But just sure. keep yourself organized above all else. Know that there's really no time to mess around here. Be professional. Uh, be, 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 this is going to be a trying process. There's no question about it. It's not easy in the slightest bit. Um, and just know that when you're done with this, it's going to have all been worth it for sure. But that's only going to, you're only going to feel that way if you really set it up for success. Uh, love hearing that. I mean, if, if it were easy, everyone would do it. So yeah, absolutely. Um, just got a comment that said there's such a thing as a shower writing tablet what <laughs> oh my god i need Jenny, i think you're on to something i think that you need to get on that i definitely need one okay so you've had some amazing success on very prominent television programs could you tell us how those came about and and offer any tips that you have to people because there's no denying that that is a great way to uh get yourself out there and increase your audience base it is. Um, and honestly, I have no publicist. Um, I used to work in PR, but I wasn't a publicist. Um, but uh, I put myself immediately, one of my, how I gained my audience was I'm always, I'm a video personality. I went onto YouTube. I started kind of there with YouTube videos. So I already was basically, I guess people would say you're made for the camera. So I was always doing those things. So um, now the Instant Pot community is one of the most popular Facebook groups. It's like over 3 million people in it at this point. And when, especially a few years ago, when the Instant Pot was really kind of new and becoming enormous, you'd have producers from television shows jumping into these rooms like, hey, I'm with GMA and I'd love to, wow. is anybody know a great blogger? Um, that, and then immediately, I'm get, all of a sudden my phone getting all these texts, you need a Jeffrey Eyes or Jeffrey Eyes? Like, I'm like, okay. And then within two seconds, my Facebook inbox, hi, I'm a producer at GMA. And I'm like, everyone's wow. recommending. So that, it's the power of social media, how that works. And these producers are smart. They found the group. They just simply asked the question there, and that's they all the work was done for them. They found somebody. Um, so I, I got lucky in that sense. Uh, Rachel Ray, um, a similar situation, I believe. They found me, and then they were yeah online. And then with Rachel, it's it started with me just doing a meatloaf, and I shot it in my own home, and then sent it to them the footage, and they edited it, and she just introduced it, and then that was it. Then they had me back a year later, and then I was in studio with her, and it, we went it went very well. We had great chemistry together, and then thankfully from there, I had two more appearances from with her, and. The last one being a Zoom when she was she's in her home uh, in upstate New York and I was in oh, my nice. kitchen. There. So it was just um, it's about the real. So that's how that worked out. It's real. Oh, and Food Network when I was on Food Network, I auditioned for that. It was for the first. It had nothing to do with instant pot cooking. It was the first ever Hanukkah challenge. It was basically like a Hanukkah chopped, and it was me. And then and I was definitely the most Jewish of the four contestants, even though I'm not religious. I'm totally secular, but I turned the Jew up to like 15. I was like, yeah. I got to the show. I was like Lachayim, you know, everything I Long Island, <laughs> Long Island accent was thicker than my favorite milkshake. Um, so you sell yourself a little bit. What can I tell you? That's how I got I got myself on these shows and maintain your relationships with these with these producers. I mean, you want to you want to just, you know, just be out there and be your be. OK, the best advice on this is just be authentic and be yourself above all else. Turn on the charm and just be know yourself, yourself and lean into it. Yes, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Be the biggest, baddest, most flamboyant version of yourself that you possibly can. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Love that. It's perfect for Pride Month. Exactly. Uh, own, <laughs> yes. own, own that. Um, yes. The other thing I was going to ask about. Um, so, what it sounds like to me, the other, the place where you were finding a lot of these connections are, are in the Facebook groups, but also being super specific about your niche and what you wanted to do. You weren't saying, I'm cooking everything for all people of all, like you were saying, I'm cooking this specifically in a small kitchen with my pressure cooker. This is what I'm doing. And then you put yourself in places where you could be known by people who are into that type of thing. Yes. 
Yes, exactly. Um, it is very niche. Um, the the instant pot is certainly a niche thing, but it's it's become so popular that it's it's like everyone. I think on I know on Prime Day they sold out of one of their most popular. Of, it was an insanely good deal. I bought one. Yesterday. <laughs> well, I am gonna me. get a joke, but yes. Well, send me after this. You send me your info, and I'll get you a books. I'll get you my books. I'm so excited. I'm happy to. Um, but it's uh, yeah. So basically, it's it, it's an opportunity, and it, 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 it when I first started doing it, there were very few blog. Now there's you can't even count how many you're doing instant pot. So it's just really about. I, I guess I got in at the right time. Uh, but you have to again. It's about sticking and standing up, sticking out and standing. What am I saying? Standing, standing apart from the rest, and yeah. really standing up with your own shtick. You know, like be. The, you have videos, Jenny, out there. You've seen them. There's countless videos where it's kind of like a tasty style video. Where there's no narrative to it except just picture, the montage, and everyone likes bite-sized content now, which is great. I get it. We have short attention spans, but my approach has always been to guide you through a recipe, to talk you through it, and I don't think that that form is dead. And uh, mm -hmm. everything old is always new again, anyway. So. We're not inviting those hands from the tasty style video onto Rachel Ray. That's not a thing that's happening. We're no, inviting yeah. the person that's standing there doing and being there with their face. Yeah, and I needed yeah. to do my nails first, you know. So. You gotta get a manicure, really, if you're gonna do one of those really tasty do. style, no question. Yeah. Um, so this has been so amazing. Before we uh, say goodbye, I would love to hear, and I'll give you a second to think about that, but what are the most valuable takeaways you've experienced throughout this process um, to share with our audience? And I will come right back to you in a second. Before we do that, everyone, we are gonna share Jeffrey's extended notes with you so that you have them. You can reference them on your own time when you watch on replay, share with your friends. Let's get everybody out there on the bestseller list or not the bestseller list creating content that you're proud of for your audience to see. And on the next Summer of Live, which is next Wednesday, June 30th at 3 p.m. Eastern, we have Melanie Ferguson. We are talking about that topic that all of us have uh, some issues with. We might need have a little PTSD. Facebook for bloggers. Let's find out how to really harness that platform and do our best with that with Melanie Ferguson. We're really excited. Um, quick reminder, Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our Facebook page so you don't miss any of our upcoming broadcasts like with our amazing guest, Jeffrey, we've had today. Please tell us your lessons that you've learned through this process. Um, what I learned, and this, really what I learned the most about it is that um, dreams come true if they if you want them to. Uh, never in a million years, and I don't wanna cry, but I might. Never in a million years that I ever think um, from five years ago when I was in a job for 10 years that I, literally felt my soul leaving my body every single day that I would be um, being able to leave that behind, become my own uh, boss, if you will, thanks to a company like Mediavine, truly, uh, who enables us to do things like that. And then from there to be able to write a book, um, it, the, the key thing that got you, that got me there more than anything else was believing in myself uh, and having, really having that, 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 that drive, the determination and the patience. And if you do have those things truly, and you really want something, you really want it, and you work hard and you really get it, it's going to come. It's going to, it's, it's going to get there for you in one way or another. And uh, that's what I've learned. It's, it's, it's just, you have the fire, you have the desire, you're going to get it. <clears throat> so that, that's what it's about for me. Well, uh, now that I'm also crying and want you to be my be my life coach, uh, please, please visit. You, we're going to share the, the presentation, but also you can see Jeffrey's recipes at Pressure, uh, Pressure Lip Cooking. We're so glad to have you as a part of the Mediavine family, and I am truly blessed to have you as my guest today. It's been wonderful. Everybody else, please say, uh, please say a fond thank you to Jeffrey, and we will see you next week. Have a great summer, you guys.